From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. With support from Genentech. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO. I'm your host, Chelsea Judge, Scientific Advisor with the Connor B. Judge Foundation. Today, it's girl power. We're talking all things related to women's health and the impact of NMO. We have Sumaira Ambassador from Tennessee, Chelsea Tucker, a mom, artist, and NMO warrior who also has just become a master life coach. Really grateful to have her on again. We're also joined again by Dr. Tamara Kaplan, another mom and neurologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital and assistant professor in neurology at Harvard Medical School. Really excited to have these ladies on with us again to offer both together a patient experience with Chelsea and clinical insight from Dr. Kaplan into women's health and its impacts of NMO. We're going to talk about body stigma and we're also going to talk about our inner mean girls and how we can friend them and overcome them. We're going to talk about the impact of NMO on fertility and menstrual cycle, as well as considerations for family planning and adoption and more. So let's jump in. Welcome Chelsea Tucker and Dr. Tamara Kaplan again for joining us on the pod. I'm so happy to have you guys on. Today we're focusing all on women's health and the impact of NMO. And this might be a little confusing because we have two Chelsea's on the pod. So <laughs> um, anytime we say Chelsea, we're referring to Chelsea Tucker, okay? And so we're just going to jump right into it. Women's health and the impact of NMO is multifaceted and there's really a lot to get into. And I just think, um, you know, NMO really is going to have an impact on identity, right? It's going to change a lot of different uh, ways that you see yourself. And I think a really pernicious one is body image. This is something that all women, myself included, we struggle with, how we see ourselves, how society says that we should look and feel. And then NMO comes along and throws a wrench potentially into all of that or makes it even more complicated. So I'm really excited to hear um, Chelsea's personal experience living with NMO, as well as clinical insight from Dr. Kaplan all about how NMO can really impact body image. So Chelsea, whatever you're comfortable with sharing, you know, we'd love to hear it because I'm sure a lot of other women with NMO are probably feeling very similar. Thank you. Yeah. Body image is, like you mentioned, just such a huge um, focus for every woman. But um, for my experience with living with NMO, it has definitely been highlighted, particularly with the way that my body has changed steroids and being um, unable to be as active as I once was. And I think that for me, what I've noticed is weight gain and with my body changing right before my eyes, Mm -hmm. um, I've really had to learn how to treat myself with more compassion, which I know sounds um, maybe a little, well, easier said than done. But I I really want to, I guess, explain what that what that means to me and when my body has gained weight or when I'm not looking my best or feeling my best, I often have to remind myself why I'm taking these medications in the first place Um, and that taking medications is a form of self-love. I think that that's sometimes uh, overlooked by all of the changes and then also realizing that not everything I think about myself is true and that everyone is born with this inner mean girl. You know, our inner mean girl is always going to be there. And uh, we don't always have to believe in our mean girl. We always have these negative comments that come up. So I really think just um, observing and really asking yourself, is this true, uh, has been helpful for me. And then also back to the whole steroid thing. So this has been my experience most often. You know, with disability and losing my eyesight and, uh, you know, losing my ability to walk, there are challenges with that. But I think with steroids, they are amazing. <laughs> but it's almost like, robbing Peter to pay Paul at the Mm. same time. There's so many things that steroids do that are not uh, lovely. And one of them for me has been weight gain. And I just think that that is just the most noticeable and the most, the quickest thing that I notice when I'm on steroids. So reminding myself that um, there's a reason that I'm taking them and that it's important, again, has been very helpful. 
Wow, Chelsea, I loved how you put it that we all have an inner mean girl and it's uh, not listening to her and realizing that that is an inner mean girl and that you need to grow that self-love or compassion because just as you put it, I loved it, that taking your medicine, uh, meeting with your neurologist, etc. These are all forms of self-love and self-care. And I just thought that that was beautifully put. Dr. Kaplan, I would really love your clinical insight now that we've heard Chelsea's personal experience. Yeah, I, I have to echo that too, though. I love this idea of this inner mean girl. I think we really do all have an inner mean girl. But, you know, I was I have a lot of things to add, and we, and we can sort of talk about this step by step. But one of the things that I think often gets ignored or there, there's less attention to is how our body image affects our sexuality. Mm. And female sexuality is, is a multidimensional subject. Um, but it's it's important to to understand, and it, it really is often undertreated. And specifically, there's been a, a very little attention in in the research literature um, paid attention to the frequency and characteristics of of sexual complaints among women with NMO. But there's this concept of of a model for um, sexual dysfunction that was originally developed to explain these problems for patients with MS, but I think it really applies to patients with NMO as well. And it's sort of three levels of this primary, secondary, and tertiary sexual dysfunction, and often patients have all three. So primary means like the neurologic changes in the central nervous system that are directly affecting, affecting sexual function, such as numbness in your genital area or decreased lubrication. Secondary sexual function is all the other physical symptoms that come with something like NMO, meaning spasticity, pain, weakness, uh, bowel and bladder dysfunction, all these things that make it, that, that really can affect our body image and, and make it not that fun to be sexually active. And then finally, you know, I think the most important thing to talk about in this context is tertiary sexual dysfunction, which is the psychological and, and social aspects of NMO that really affect sexual feelings negatively. And, you know, people have a negative self-image or, or lower self-esteem. It's really hard to want to be sexually active. So it's important to realize that all these things can be contributing and, and really be um, multifaceted. Those are really good points. And I could see, especially how you focused on the psychological impacts, that if you have a poor body image or your inner mean girl um, is really loud, that that's going to decrease your sexual desire. Right. And if you're not feeling aroused, it's really difficult to initiate sexual activity. Ugh, yeah, exactly. So it's like this vicious feedback loop or something. It kind of all ties in together. Dr. Kaplan, you're talking about very, very important topics that are absolutely overlooked, but they're also very sensitive. And for a patient to bring these up with their doctor, it's going to require that they have a very good working relationship with their doctor. Uh, because this is not something that is uh, often asked. And so if you're going to bring it up, I just highly recommend that uh, you have a very wonderful working relationship with your treating physician. And I think that's so true too. And there's actually some evidence uh, on this, but it's sort of this cat and mouse game, I should say, um, where doctors don't talk about it because they're like, well, the patient never brought it up. And mm. then the patient never brought it up because they're like, well, I didn't know that this doctor would be able to help me with these problems. So I didn't, or I didn't feel comfortable bringing it up. So then nobody talks about it and it stays, you, you know, closeted, like, and, and nobody's doing anything when these are the things that really can affect someone's quality of life. So you're absolutely right, Chelsea, having a good relationship with your doctor and feeling comfortable to, to talk about these things is really important. And I would say it's almost like an act of bravery. I can see how that would be very awkward or a little intimidating to bring up, but how it, how it could really improve your quality of life is so important. How um, both uh, Chelsea and your personal experience and then Dr. Kaplan love to hear your clinical insight, you know, other ways of um, NMO might impact your female identity, so to speak, right? For example, like your period, like that is key to being a woman and is a big part of your identity. That's another thing that we also don't like to talk about because it can be weird or awkward or feeling gross, but I could see that that does play a huge role on your personal identity as a woman. And I could see how NMO, whether directly or indirectly or via the treatments for it, could potentially influence that a bit. 
Absolutely. Well, Chelsea, you just said three words. You said weird, awkward, and gross. <laughs> and I want to talk about that because those are very shameful ways mm-hmm. that we view our bodies and the things that are going on within our bodies. And this is gonna this has taken me a lot of practice, and I have not mastered it. I probably never will. But when we have those kinds of thoughts, this is weird, awkward, gross. Um, that doesn't make us feel very good about ourselves. And I actually think when we have those thoughts, we're less likely to seek help or treatment, whether it be from the medical doctor or for mental health clinician because we feel ashamed and that is absolutely something that I've experienced with the changes that have happened within my body and with my menstrual cycle a lot of shame the shameful thoughts that have really happened um and I've had to really kind of examine those and uh, again I'm not perfect and I'll probably always deal with a little bit of shame around that but as far as uh, menstrual cycle goes and my identity as a woman you're you hit the nail on the head NMO uh, it doesn't become our identity, but we have to integrate it into our lives. And so with delayed periods or missed periods, that's just something that I've had to, again, integrate into my life. But it absolutely does affect the way that I see myself. Um, but again, it's just examining those thoughts. And uh, weird, awkward, and gross would be something our mean girl says, right? Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking as soon as I said, I'm like, Chelsea, to myself, Chelsea Judge, that is your inner mean girl talking. And I could see then if um, how my inner mean girl could then come Come across um, to other people, right? Like we're all then perpetuating the inner mean girl thing. So thank you. What you said was so beautiful and so on the nose. And Dr. Dr. Kaplan, um, so Chelsea talked about her personal experience with this, but what what's the clinical reality? Is it NMO that is impacting the menstrual cycle or is it the treatments? What is it? First of all, I just want to echo again all the things that Chelsea said. And I think, you know, these messages convey to to young women at a very early age that their period is gross or makes makes them uncomfortable when really like it's part of who we are that's what makes us women that's what gives us the ability to make babies so you know i think people um should embrace their femininity in this way um but but what you said is is really interesting so there is some research that shows that that has found that changes in menstruation often occur actually after NMOSD onset. Um, And one recent study reported that 43.8 women, uh, patients, said that their menstruation was suddenly irregular um, after the onset of NMO. And it's interesting because, you know, is this an effect of of, um, treatment or NMO itself? I don't think we really know. But one thing that I wanted to circle back to that Chelsea had mentioned before is steroids. So steroids can definitely affect menstruation. They can cause um, irregular periods and uh, and that sort of thing. But I also wanted to comment on, on the weight issue. Steroids or corticosteroids, as they're called in the the medical term, are really synthetic versions of this hormone called cortisol, which is a natural hormone in the body. And it's responsible for that fight or flight response and also helpful with decreasing inflammation as one of the reasons that steroids are used with NMOSD. But steroids do cause weight gain um, by a few mechanisms. They um, alter the body's electrolyte and water balances, and and they also change um, someone's metabolism. Essentially, steroids contribute to weight gain by in a few ways. One, by increasing appetite. um, Two, by fluid retention. And three, by changes in where body stores fat. Um, Like people who have been on steroids for a long time, it really changes even their appearance. Um, people start having um, rounder faces and, and the, you know, seeing that fat stores in places it never did before. And I think all of these things also contribute in such a significant way, as Chelsea mentioned, to, to body image. And sort of the general rule of thumb on this is that higher doses of steroids for longer periods of time are more likely to um, cause weight gain. And generally, we think that very short courses of just a couple days don't usually produce these side effects, but um, there's such a spectrum. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, and this also affects menstruation, as I said. And the other thing about menstruation is it's part of our femininity. And when it's irregular, that sort of makes us feel irregular. So I, I think these are all really important things to think about. 
I think that, right, we have to overcome our inner mean girls. We have to show more self-love and care. We have to be able to look in the mirror and at least show some compassion or love for what we see and realize that maybe we're, like you just said, like we're taking things, our bodies are going through these changes. So of course our identity will change right along with it. I can imagine if um, NMO, whether directly or the treatments are impacting a woman's menstrual cycle, that there then might be some implications on overall like fertility and family planning. Again, why maybe directly or indirectly. Um, Dr. Kaplan, I think from a clinical perspective, do different treatments impact family planning considerations? Yes. And before even mentioning treatments, I think it's important to, to question, does NMO itself affect fertility? Um, and this is something that's being studied now. And there is some evidence that fertility may be affected in patients with NMOSD. And a, a published study in 2018 showed that um, patients with NMOSD were more likely to have reduced levels of a specific hormone called anti-malarian hormone, which is a hormone that is used to measure your ovarian reserve. So the higher the better that means you've got like a lot of eggs ready to to you know to become babies but if you have low levels it is much more challenging to get pregnant and we have seen that in patients with NMOSD there's a higher risk of miscarriage um, there's also an increased risk of obstetric complications and even postpartum NMO relapse so it's not to say that women with with NMO cannot get pregnant at all but it's to say that if a woman does desire pregnancy, it's a it can be a multidisciplinary coordinated event with their doctors, with their neurologists, their OBGYN, all of those things. But as far as treatment goes, yes, these do affect pregnancy and, and risk to to our children, to babies. Uh, on the good side, uh, medications like azathioprine, rituximab, eculizumab, and even glucocorticoids or steroids seem to be relatively safe in pregnancy and are the treatments of choice. Tocilizumab uh, can also be considered in women who have very severe NMOSD. On the other hand, medications like Celsept or methotrexate are absolute no's mm. in pregnancy. But both of those medications have been, um, are absolutely contraindicated. Wow. There is a lot of impact then, whether directly or because of the treatments of NMO on family planning considerations. And I you know, want to show sensitivity to this because I have a lot of friends who do not have NMO but are also having difficulties just conceiving. So I know this can be an incredibly personal and emotional, of course, journey. But I also wanted to say here that like there's more than one ways to becoming a mother, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, sci- science um, and also just adoption, right? There's a lot of different mechanisms for fertility considerations and, and you know, work having a great relationship with your uh, clinical care team to time treatments for pregnancy, but also looking at other avenues of ways to um, make a family, whether it's fostering or adoption. And Chelsea, if you are willing to share your experience because you have a big, beautiful family, we would love to hear it. Thank you. i just like to echo so much of what Dr. Kaplan said, so much of what you just said. Family planning and just keeping in mind that it is such a sensitive topic for so many women, not just those who are living with NMOSD and men. It's not just you know a decision that you're going to make with you and your partner. It really is a decision that you're going to have to make with your doctors and your specialists. I think that uh, that just, again, reiterates the relationship that you really need to have with your treating physicians because there there are a lot of things to consider before you um, decide to start a family. I know for me and my story, I didn't ever feel like it was safe enough to come off of treatment. And I'm on one of the medications Dr. Kaplan mentioned as an absolutely not, do not get pregnant on um, these medications. And so I felt like just for me and my, my stability that me conceiving children was just not going to be an option. So for me and my family, I have five adopted children. We, uh, my husband and I adopted them from foster care. And just the way that that story happened was absolutely beautiful and it was organic to us. We just felt like it was the right way to go. Now, I will say that we never envisioned us adopting five children. <laughs> that was not uh, something that we ever dreamed of. But adoption was absolutely an option. It wasn't plan B. It was really plan A for, for us from the very start. And so we've been blessed with five children. Um, 
through adoption. But again, like you mentioned, there are many, many different avenues these days if you want to start a family. It's just really what's best for you and your body. And I do think, again, making those decisions as a family, but also uh, with your treating providers is a really good idea. Wow, Chelsea, thank you for sharing that. That is incredible. And I, I'm inspired. That's beautiful. I'm inspired too. Yes. I, I was going right? to say, I have two children and I think that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Not even imagine life with five, but that sounds just like such a beautiful, rich, wonderful family. Yes, I, I love it. And Dr. Kaplan, have you seen in your clinical experience when with some of your female patients or even your male patients, um, have they had similar approaches Have or have you helped walk them through conception? Both, actually. I um, I have a patient that also made the decision to adopt a, a beautiful baby. And um, she was, and I actually got to be somewhat involved in the process because I, got, I had to write a note that said, you know, she was fit to be a parent. And I said, this woman is going to be the most amazing mom ever. <laughs> I, but I, you know, I also have patients that have desired to get pregnant on their own. And I've actually formed a relationship with um, some of our reproductive endocrinologists, which are the, the doctors that help with fertility planning. Because if patients do want to go off medicine, they don't necessarily have the luxury of just being off mm-hmm. for a long time and just waiting to conceive. Because as, as this has been mentioned, you know, it's not sometimes somehow getting pregnant is not as easy as they made it seem in high school sex ed (laughs) for a lot of people and and so you know patients with um nmo and and ms too don't necessarily have the luxury of being off medicine for a long time and if they are going to stay on medicine how are we going to plan that so it really has to be a very coordinated effort and I always give this talk to my patients too. Like it's it's not going to be that you are somewhere on the beach in the Caribbean drinking Mai Tais and suddenly you're pregnant. Like we need to plan this. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's definitely the, as people would say, there's like the Instagram or like the picture perfect versus reality of it. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, you guys have just been a wealth of information. I'm loving it. We've had a lot of discussion, right, on the direct or indirect impacts of NMO on body image, on basic biological processes like sexual identity and menstrual cycle and fertility and family planning. So I can imagine and I know that there are economic impacts of NMO as well, right? It can be the all the factors of the stress and the emotional impact of NMO um, that can make it more difficult for a woman to progress in her career or be a mother, be a friend, etc. And then I think of the treatment costs of some of these NMO medications, right? They can be quite expensive, especially if you don't have access to quality or affordable health insurance that can be huge. And for most people, at least in America, your access to health insurance comes from employment. And I can imagine that if you're going through an NMO flare, you have pronounced disability, physical disability, or maybe potentially cognitive dysfunction related to NMO, that that could also affect your employment status, whether you might have to leave the workforce or you're underemployed, and therefore you might not have access to good or affordable health insurance. And I just, how that must affect, you know, your ultimate, your health is, is huge as well. And how a lot of NMO patients then have to turn to disability access to make sure that they have their basic needs met as well, especially that access to health care. And, you know, this that's a huge, huge separate discussion that we definitely have to um, discuss later. But I just wanted to bring this up because I think there's also the uh, economic and financial health impact of NMO on women's health as well. For me, in my experience, I applied for disability and I'm currently on disability. And there was such a huge amount of shame that mm-hmm. I had even applying for disability because what I made it mean, I made it mean that I was disabled and no longer could take care of myself. And then this mean girl said, now you can no longer take care of your family. So I just want to say that there is no shame in applying for disability or uh, applying for grants to cover your medications. Again, it's all self-love. 
and it's we're, we're doing this from a place of love so i really appreciate you bringing that up because i think again that, that is something that is not often talked about mm-hmm. uh, but should be mentioned more so thank you for bringing that up yeah and just to be transparent since we're on the topic um you know my family with my brother with his nmo my husband with his ms were relatively experienced with the disability process and there is a lot of stigma to it but it is there for a reason it is to empower people it is a form of self-love and societal love to make sure that people can have their their basic needs met, right? To make sure that they can pay their bills, provide for their family, and also, of course, uh, make sure that they can have their medications covered and they don't go into debt over that. And there's definitely a time and a place in the appropriate uh, patients, and I think a lot of NMO patients meet those requirements. And so I think that, yeah, we also need to change the stigma around that as well. And, and I also just want to add that even if you're not employed by a company or going to an office every day, as well, nobody is right now, um, pretty much. But, you know, I mean, Chelsea specifically, you are being a mom is the hardest job in the world. And you're working full time every day. You work 24 seven without lunch breaks, without paid vacation, uh, without sick days. You know, I think being a mom is is one of the hardest jobs in the whole world, no matter if you're all also working an additional job or not. Um, So I just want to give credit to all the moms out there. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. I will not argue (laughs) with you on that. Um, I did have to remind myself that's such a great point that, no, I do work. I think it's more than a full-time job at this point. I wouldn't have it any other way. But yeah, despite all of the health challenges that I have, absolutely, I do and can absolutely still provide for my family. So thank you so much. Thank you to you, you both for being on the pod with us today. Um, Chelsea, Dr. Kaplan, just wow, sharing your personal experiences, the clinical insights. I, I really hope that this challenges, or no, 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 empowers all people, um, especially women navigating their health with NMO to, to confront their inner mean girl and show some self-love. Thank you so much for having us. It was great Thank talk. you, Chelsea. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan.